Section 9.7, Graphing Polar Functions. So in this section we continue talking about polar coordinates and polar functions. And we are talking now about functions whose equations look like r equals f of theta which makes sense because when we've talked about how to graph polar coordinates we've usually thought about making the rotation through an angle of theta first and then proceeding out along that radial line at a distance of r or in the opposite direction if that r value is negative so in that sense uh, where I land on my point depends on the rotation I make and then once I make that rotation I'm trying to write a formula for this function that determines the r based on that theta. So from here on out we'll talk about r being a function of theta or r equals f of theta. Um, that probably seems a little counterintuitive and should bother you a little bit considering when we write rectangular coordinates uh, for a long long time you've been trained to think of the second coordinate as being a function of the first coordinate uh, but now the convention in how we write pol polar coordinates is actually backwards. We're saying the first coordinate is being treated as a function of the second coordinate. Uh, sorry, that's just the convention and, and that's how we do it. Um, it does make for a little confusion at first though. Uh, just try and keep those two straight. When we write the function notation, even though we plot the points as r theta points, we are going to treat that first coordinate, the r, as a function of theta in all of these graphs that we look at. Now, uh, when it comes to polar graphs, there are many, many different kinds, and some of which are very exotic. Uh, we're, we're not going to get into those in this class. In fact, that's not really done in typical calculus classes. What you see on the table here is a table of common polar curves that you would see in a typical Calculus 2 course. Um, this is not meant to be some sort of comprehensive study of polar curves, but this is a set of common polar curves that are useful in applications and also instructive in the behavior of polar functions. And of course at the top we see uh, circles, both circles centered at uh, the origin and circles that are tangent to the x and y axes. So those seem like those would be pretty important. Um, the other three I'll talk about briefly here. Uh, but first let's look at the, the row with the circles. So if I blow this up a little bit, um, obviously r equals a is a circle of radius a and we talked about that uh, in the previous lecture. If you look at the next two, they're pretty important graphs. Uh, r equals a sine theta, r equals a cosine theta. Um, r equals a sine theta is a circle that's tangent to the x-axis. Uh, notice in that formula that when theta is pi over 2, you would be pointed straight up. And sine of pi over 2 would be 1, which means you'd be talking about a circle of diameter a, if a was a positive number. Therefore, the formula a, r equals a sine of theta, where a is positive, gives you a circle that lies above the x-axis, tangent to the x-axis at the pole, with a radius of a over 2. Um, I will say that not everything is spelled out in this table for you. Uh, the circle you see here is the one you would get if a was greater than 0. If a was less than 0, it would be down here. Similarly for the next one, if a is positive, then a cosine theta is that circle you see on the right tangent to the y-axis. If a is negative, it would be a circle over here. Uh, same thing for the spiral. The spiral is a neat graph, but it's not something we're going to use very much. But uh, the picture they're showing you is for positive a. If a is negative, notice that when I begin my rotation and I'm pointing in these directions, a negative a would mean that I shoot backwards in the opposite direction, which means I would be tracing out a curve that looked like this instead. It would still be spiraling out counterclockwise, uh, but it wouldn't, it would be turned, it would be rotated 180 degrees or, or half a turn.
All right, the next row is a pretty important one. Those are called the Limachons. Um, and for those, uh, let's take a look at this applet for a moment. Okay, so this applet uh, sums up what we mean with the Limachons and how they change when we change the parameters. So in general, when I talk about a Limachon, um, notice there they say R is equal to A plus or minus B sine theta or B cosine theta. Um, and in this applet, let's look at the ratio of A to B. So right now in the example you can see A is 1 and B is 1. If the ratio of A to B is 1, then what you have there is a cardioid. And that's the one you see in that second entry on that Limachon row, the one where it says A equals B. And I'll say more about the cardioid in a minute, but now let's look at the other ones. What happens if I move the slider to the right? Then of course the ratio of A to B is now less than 1. I'm dividing 1 by something bigger than 1. So if that ratio is less than 1, then what you get is a Limachon with a loop. Now what if I go the other way and I make that B number smaller than 1, so now the ratio of A to B is larger than 1, then what you have now is that point at the origin has moved down, and now I call that a dimpled Limachon. Okay, notice what happens as I approach 1 plus 0.5 sine of theta. It looks like when I get to 0.5, the dimple is gone and it's sort of flattened out at the bottom. Okay, if that ratio of A to B is greater than 2, like it is now, now what I call that is a convex Limachon. And that's what you see in that last picture. And, you know, if you look closely, it's not a circle. It's, it's definitely a deformed circle. In fact, if you watch what's happening in the applet, as I move this down, you can see the bottom is flattening out. And the top is contracting to something more like a circular arc. In fact, what happens if I shrink that all the way to B equals zero, then of course I have a circle. Okay, so basically we're running through all these Limachons and we're calling them all Limachons because they're all just variations of the same formula where I'm varying this ratio of A to B from Limachons with loops to cardioids, which is when A equals B exactly, to dimpled Limachons to convex Limachons. Uh, notice one thing about how these are all traced out. So if I look at the cardioid, for example, uh, notice that as theta increases from 0, R is positive. It's positive as I continue rotating. Now I'm at theta equals pi. Theta equals 3 pi over 2. I'm back at the pole. Now I've made it to theta equals 2 pi. Notice that all the way around my R was positive. I was always tracing out R in the positive direction, in the direction I was facing. Okay, what happens if I move this down to a convex Limachon? Still the same. Period is 2 pi. It's traced out from 0 to 2 pi. R is positive all the way around. Okay, what happens if I look at the Limachon with a loop? Okay, positive, R is positive, R is positive, R is positive. All the way from 0 to pi, R is positive. From pi to 3 pi over 2, well, now wait a minute. Look what happens there. Now my R is negative. All right, so let's back up. From 0 to pi, R is positive. And then from pi to some angle between pi and 3 pi over 2, my r is still positive. And for this one, it looks like it's somewhere around maybe pi over 4. It is going to depend on the a and b values. But then what happens from that angle 
all the way to 3 pi over 2. All of my r's are negative. And notice the r's are still negative from 3 pi over 2 to some angle over here between 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi. And of course the angle that I see right here between the negative y-axis and that theta value and the negative y-axis and that theta value are the same. And then from that theta to 2 pi, my r is positive again. So what I'm saying there is among all the Limachons, the Limachons with loops, you have to be a little bit careful when you're tracing around them. It's not positive r all the way around. There is a portion, that is where the loop is, where your r's are negative. That is from that theta value to that theta value. Okay, if we go back to our table, the next row you see is the roses, and you can see it's basically a series of flower shapes with different petals. Uh, notice the summary shows you that if I'm looking at, and by the way, in this table it shows only uh, cosine of n theta roses, uh, but it does mention over here on the side under the heading that you can also have a sine of n theta. Okay, the the position of the petals will be a little diff bit different when you switch to sign, but you're still going to have the same configuration. That is, if I'm looking at cosine of n theta and n is odd, there will be exactly n petals. If it's cosine of n theta and n is even, there will be two n petals. So for example, when I look at this applet, what I am looking at right there is r equals sine of 4 theta. Notice there are 8 petals. And notice when I go to trace this out, uh, there's an interesting behavior here. r is positive for that petal. r is negative for the next petal. r is positive for that petal. r is negative for the next petal. So from petal to petal, R alternates between being positive and negative. Uh, notice something else. The period that is the sweep of theta necessary to traverse this entire rose is definitely 0 to 2 pi. And notice since there are 8 petals, that means sweeping out each of those petals would be 2 pi divided by 8, which would be pi over 4. So it's no surprise that it takes... 45 degrees to get the first pedal, another 45 degrees to get the next pedal, another 45 degrees to get the next pedal, and so on. All right, so for these cosine or sine of n theta where n is even roses, where there are two n roses, that means the period is 2 pi, and I'm sweeping out each one of those petals in 2 pi over... 2n, which means pi over n. And think about that. We said there was 4 here in this example, so that means pi over 4, which is exactly the period of each one of those petals. What happens if I drop this back to an odd? Well, notice now there's one petal. Looks like that's 60 degrees. There's the second petal. Now notice in this case, r is positive r is negative, r is positive. So again, we have that alternating of the r from pedal to pedal. Looks like it's 60 degrees, looks like it's 120, looks like it's 180. Okay, now that means what? If that n is odd, it looks like the period necessary to cover this entire flower or this entire rose is pi, not 2 pi. Okay, that means if I take pi and divide it by n, that would be pi over n again. In this case, that would be pi over 3, and that's exactly right. In other words, what we're saying is, for both the even and the odd cases, the period necessary to trace out one petal is pi over n, whether n is even or odd.
Um, notice when I jump up to 5, we're saying then what? Since n is odd, we're saying the period of one of those petals should be pi over 5, which would be 36 degrees. And that looks right, 36 degrees, 72 degrees, 108 degrees, and so on. Again, uh, the thing to be careful about with these is just to realize that when you go from petal to petal, the sign of R is changing. Now, I'll mention this in the next section, but uh, what, what would an obvious thing I might want? What's an obvious thing I might want to do with this rose? I might want to find the area of one of those petals. Well, since we have symmetries in graphs like this, I don't need to do some sort of integration around the entire rose to get the area of all five petals. We can simply integrate to find the area of one of the petals and multiply by five. And so I don't really have to fuss too much about R being positive and then negative and then positive. I'll just work on one of the petals and then multiply by the number of petals. Okay, one last thing uh, I'll mention about the cardioid, just because it's uh, kind of special. So, you know, we said the cardioid was a particular type of lemachon. It's the one where the ratio of A to B is 1. But the cardioid is also something else uh, fairly special. It's actually another one of these locus of points that we get by uh, observing distances or relationships of one geometric figure to another. In this case, I'm going to roll the black circle around the blue circle, and I'm going to watch that red point where they're touching in the beginning. So right now, theta is equal to 0. And now when I rotate, just watch the path of the red dot. And of course, when I roll the circle all the way around, obviously that green angle in the blue circle is my theta. And of course, now when I rotate to 2 pi, I'm back to where I started. And what I've got there is a cardioid. So the other interpretation of the cardioid is it's the path of a point on a circle that's rotating around another circle if that point was initially uh, tangent to the other circle when we began the rotation. Now, as I said, this is a survey of polar graphing, so we're not going to get uh, carried away and try and look at exotic graphs. So using your graphing utility in conjunction with these well-known functions and the formulas for them should make uh, what you have to do with these graphs a lot easier because uh, there's, there's a lot of predictability to what you're doing because they're mostly known polar functions and polar graphs. Uh, so with that said, um, here is the link I told you about in Desmos. Um, I've got some preloaded here, uh, but let me just point out how I'm entering these. Um, if you look at that, they come in pairs, so there's three pairs there. And this is similar to what I described when we were building that parametric grapher uh, with a small difference. Uh, notice in that first line what I've typed in is R equals... Uh, actually, let's look at the, the second pair, the one that starts with R equals cosine theta. So I actually typed in r equals cosine of, and when I typed in theta, I have to type in the word theta, T-H-E-T-A. Uh, when I did that, it asked me for a slider. I created a slider, uh, and I picked a variable b. Now notice the way I've constructed the, the range or the interval for the r equals cosine theta function. I've run it from 0 to b. And then in the next line, I've created a slider that takes b from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, what that allows you to do in Desmos is move the slider and watch the graph be traced out. Now, actually, if you notice, uh, when I go from 0 to pi, because you can see that's about 3.14 there, that's telling me the period of that circle, which is one of those... Uh, equations we just looked at a minute ago has a period of pi. In other words, if I go from pi to 2 pi, what I'm actually doing is tracing out the circle twice. All right, so you can make up your own entries for different functions here, and this is how you could uh, make this a lot easier on yourself. Um, and actually, uh, the one I wanted to show you here was the lemniscate. 
which is the pair you see down here at the bottom. So there's the lemnus gate that lies along the polar axis, and then there's the one that lies along the line theta equals pi over 4, which is that tilted one, the one with the sine 2 theta as the argument. Um, so notice, if I wanted to graph that, I could simply take the square root of both sides, and I would get r equals plus or minus a times the square root of sine 2 theta. Okay, it turns out if you graph both of those, uh, you're going to get the same graph. They're just going to be traced out differently. So the physical graph is that figure 8 that you see. And I could certainly graph both of them separately, but I just have entered the positive one here. So on that fifth line down, you can see I've entered r equals 2 times the square root of sine 2 theta. I've run my interval from 0 to c, and then in the next line I've created a slider that takes c from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, notice uh, what happens when I, I guess I need to turn it on. So notice what happens when I begin increasing the theta. I'm tracing out my graph. <clears throat> okay, where am I right there? Well, it looks like I'm about at 1.5 or so. That's pi over 2. And obviously you can see that there I'm pointing to pi over 4. There I'm pointing to pi over 3. There I'm pointing at pi over 2, and actually I'm back at the origin. Now, curiously, what happens when I move the slider a little bit further? It doesn't seem like anything's happening. Well, that should make sense. If I'm sitting at pi over 2 right there, what happens when I try and make that theta value a little bit larger? Inside that square root, you're going to have the sine of 2 times something a little bit bigger than pi over 2. 2 times something a little bit bigger than pi over 2 is a little bit bigger than pi. And if you're in bigger than pi, you're in quadrant 3. Uh, sine is negative in quadrant 3, meaning that function with the square root is not defined in quadrant 3. That's why when I'm moving the slider from pi over 2, well, where does it pick up again? It picks up again right there at, looks like, 3.14 at pi. That's because when I plug pi back into my square root formula up there, anything bigger than pi would make 2 theta bigger than 2 pi. That puts me back in quadrant 1 where the sign is positive again. Okay, but when I do that, I'm going to trace out the other half of the figure 8. Okay, meaning, again, for example, if I was trying to figure out the area inside one of those halves of the lemnus gate, you do see that I could integrate, and I promised you a formula for that here in the next section. Uh, I'm definitely going from 0 to pi over 2 to get that guy. Um, I would not want to do any sort of integration from pi, I'm sorry, from pi over 2 to pi because the function isn't even defined there. But from pi to 3 pi over 2, I'm definitely getting the other half of the lemnus gate. And actually from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, the function's undefined again. So again, it's, it's uh, something always to be watchful of when you're tracing one of these out. Uh, keeping track of whether the r is positive or negative. And in the case of something like a lemnus gate where there's a square root, um, I still obviously can't have a negative value under that square root. So there are values of theta for which a polar function might not be defined. And of course, this Desmos utility uh, really helps you see these things uh, much easier than doing them by hand. Now I will show you, uh, you know, how to trace one of these by hand, and there's nothing really profound about it. It's just sort of an arduous task of making a table, uh, plotting points, connecting dots, making sure you're, you're keeping track of whether R is positive or negative, making sure you haven't missed any behavior, and largely that's just making sure your, your table is comprehensive enough. So as I mentioned in our meeting, I'm going to go over a couple of things here now about symmetries which are useful, but uh, in truth, you're not going to use them a lot. Um, however, it's, it's something you should see at least once, and uh, it could come in useful a few, few times. Uh, 
So let's look at symmetries of polar graphs. Okay, so when we say symmetries, we're talking about those same symmetries you talked about in college algebra. Symmetry with respect to the y-axis, the x-axis, and the origin. Uh, starting with the x-axis, uh, so if this was my pole and this was the polar axis, and let's say I had a point right here, which was r theta. Of course, that means I'm lying along that radial line, and that's r, and that's theta. And you would agree that if I was going to have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, that point would have to show up here, reflected across the x-axis. And of course, I know that this would be negative theta, and this would still be r. Okay, so that means if r theta is on the graph, this graph would have symmetry with respect to the x-axis if and only if r negative theta was on the graph. But remember what we talked about in the last lecture. Um, there are always an infinite number of ways to get to any polar location. And really, you always have to consider at least two. Because remember, for any position that you want to get at, there's two ways to get there, two basic ways. You can start at the origin and move in that direction, or you can be facing in the opposite direction and move backwards. All right, you do notice that if I was facing in this opposite direction, that would be an angle of negative theta minus pi. And so if I was positioned at an angle of negative theta plus, or negative theta minus pi, and I rotated or I shot backwards negative r, that would put me at the same position. So another thing that could be happening to produce this symmetry is that if r theta is on the graph, so is negative r negative theta minus pi. And obviously there are infinitely many more combinations. I know that if I add 2 pi, for example, to this, then that's still going to be equivalent because, well, not necessarily, but if my functions are sine or cosine and have period 2 pi, adding 2 pi to that argument, that angle, would get me back to the same location. Now we already know, obviously, not all trig functions are periodic with period 2 pi, uh, but whatever that period was of my function, I can certainly rotate around either a full turn or a half turn or whatever the period is and get many, many more representations. But let's just say these are the two basic ones. And so these are the two tests for symmetry. That is, if I'm checking to see if there's x-axis symmetry, there are two basic ones that I should check. And every other representation would just be a variation of one of those two. If r theta is on my polar graph, is r negative theta or negative r negative theta minus pi. And if one of those two is on the graph, that means I have x-axis symmetry. OK, we can analyze y-axis symmetry the same way, except now, of course, we're saying that if this is r and this is theta, then I'm looking for a point over here where this angle would be that theta and this would be that same r. So I think what that says is if r theta is on the graph, I would definitely want r comma, OK, would that be pi minus theta? Would that be this positive angle measured counterclockwise from the polar axis?
It's basically the angle for which that red theta is the reference angle. Okay, what's the other way I could get to that same location right there? Again, I could be pointing this direction and then just go backwards. So that means the other thing that could be getting me to that green point up here that would prove I have symmetry is that I go backwards from facing in this direction. Okay, what's the angle for that direction? Well, if this is theta, this is negative theta. All right, so the test for symmetry for y-axis is if our theta is on the graph, then I ask number one, is r pi minus theta on the graph? That's a question mark. Or is negative r negative theta on the graph? And I really do mean question marks up here. We're checking to see if those coordinates r and theta satisfy that equation we started with. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Okay, what's the other kind of symmetry you remember from college algebra? Symmetry with respect to the origin. So, of course, for that we're saying uh, if this is x and this is y, then we're saying over here at negative x and down here at negative y, we should have the same point. Okay, obviously those two points are going to be lying across from each other, across the origin on that line, uh, whatever that theta is. So, you know, if this was pi over 6, this would be the line theta equals pi over 6. Okay, let's say we've got our point where this is theta and this is r. So, of course, the question again is, what are the two basic ways I can get to that green point? Well, one would be to rotate around so that I'm actually facing in the direction of the, red, the green point and then just go out a distance of positive r. Well, I know this angle right here is a vertical angle to that red theta in the first quadrant, so I know that angle is theta. So that green angle looks like pi plus theta. So I think the representation we'd be talking about is if r theta, which is this point, is on the graph, then that should be happening if and only if r comma pi plus theta is also on the graph. Okay, what's the other way, again, that I could get there? Well, if r theta is on the graph, the other way I could get to that green point is to be facing this direction but move backwards. Well, to face that direction, I just have to rotate through an angle of positive theta and then go backwards. So going backwards with an angle of theta. In other words, my test for symmetry with respect to the origin would be if r theta is a polar point that satisfies my equation, then does, and this would be question mark, does r pi plus theta satisfy my equation and does or does negative r comma theta satisfy my equation. So let's look at a quick example just to see these tests. Uh, let's look at you know a typical polar graph so we'll we'll pick one of those ones we just looked at. Okay what is this one? Well if you remember anything that looked like a plus or minus b cosine or sine of theta was one of those cardioids and in fact, if you were to go to Desmos and draw a picture of this one, uh, what you would see would be something like this. And this is a really terrible picture, but something like that. And 
it should be pretty easy to say what that starting point is. And this equation, when theta is 0, that would be 2 plus 2 times cosine of 0, which would be 4. So that starting point right there is r equals 4, theta equals 0. So just be careful there. Um, I do mean 4, 0 in polar coordinates. Uh, but in this case, that does just happen to coincide with the rectangular coordinates. But I really do mean, oops, I really do mean the polar coordinates here of r equals 4 when theta equals 0. Okay, then as I rotate, of course, what happens, those radial lines are going to trace out my curve. And I can actually draw the picture and see it happening. When I get to pi over 2, I'm sitting there. From pi over 2 to pi, I'm going to trace out that part, which means when I get back to pi, I should be back at the pole. Well, if you check it, when theta is pi, that'll be 2 plus 2 cosine of pi, which is 2 minus 2, which is 0. Then from pi to 3 pi over 2, my radial lines are tracing out that little part. Then from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, I'm tracing out this part. Okay, there's my polar graph. Now, we already know from, you know, the fact that this is a known function and from our table that this definitely has x-axis symmetry. Uh, but I just want to look at an example just to show you how the tests are working and how you could conclude there's a symmetry even if you didn't know what the graph looks like. So let's look at the x-axis test, the x-axis symmetry, which if you scroll back to the last page, it was what? If I assume r theta satisfies my equation, the question is, will either of these two, that is r negative theta or negative r negative theta minus pi, Okay, what's my equation? It's r equals 2 plus 2 cosine theta. So what I mean here is when I say if r theta satisfies this question does, or this equation does r negative theta, I mean substitute r and negative theta for r and theta in this equation. In other words, I'm going to leave r as it is, but I'm going to change that theta to a negative theta. Okay, what do I know about cosine? It's an even function. And even functions like cosine are ones for which if I take f of negative x, it's the same as f of x. So that tells me that, or I know that cosine of negative theta is the same thing as cosine of theta, which means this is really r equals 2 plus 2 cosine of theta, which is the same equation I started with. So it's obviously equivalent. Okay, that's sufficient right there to tell me that I have x-axis symmetry. I don't need to check both of these things. I just need to show at least one of these is true. All right, now, what's going to happen for this one if I try the other two tests? Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but let's just see a failure of a test. So if I wanted to do the x-axis test, I'm sorry, the y-axis test, uh, which means if r theta is on the graph, I want to know if that implies either 1, that r pi minus theta is on the graph, or 2, negative r minus theta is on the graph. doesn't really matter which one you pick. I'll pick the, the one that looks a little simpler, that second one. So I go back to my function which was r equals 2 plus 2 cosine of theta. And that's what, uh, if I substitute negative r for r, and I substitute negative theta for theta, and we just said that cosine is an even function, which means this just goes back to cosine theta, uh, that means I have negative r equals 2 plus 2 cosine theta. Or in other words, r equals negative 2 plus 2 cosine theta. And that is obviously not equivalent 
to my starting function. It's the opposite of it. That means this y-axis symmetry test has failed. Now, in this one, of course, and this is going to be the case with many of these basic polar graphs, um, this is why I said in the beginning you're not going to have to bother checking symmetry too much because you're working with functions which uh, come from a stock library of known functions, which means once you recognize that it's a cardioid or some other kind of lemachon or lemniscate or a circle that has a certain symmetry, you're, you're going to know that ahead of time and you're not actually going to have to check things like this. But you can see that for more exotic polar graphs, this could be useful. Uh, it means that if I was making an exhaustive table to try and plot points and determine the shape of a graph, uh, for example, if I knew there was symmetry with respect to the y-axis, I could simply determine what the right half of the graph looks like, and then by symmetry I'd automatically know what the left half looks like. Useful, but not something we're going to have to make uh, extensive use of in here. Okay, the next thing to talk about is finding the slope of a polar curve. Okay, so now be careful with this. Uh, this, this is something that uh, trips people up sometimes. If I have a polar curve of some kind, so you know, suppose I have some sort of a some sort of a cardioid like that, and let's say I pick some point on that graph, and I would like to know the slope of that tangent line. And of course, at that tangent line, or at that point of tangency, there is some r and theta. Okay, now be careful. We know that if we're viewing this as a rectangular function, and obviously there is some equivalent rectangular formula for any polar graph, uh, whether it's easy to deal with or not, it's another matter, but there is definitely some rectangular equation. And when I ask you for the slope of that polar equation, uh, you know that would be the rate of change of y with respect to x um, evaluated at this r theta point, whatever that physical point is. And of course that point has its own x and y coordinates, some rectangular coordinates. And I would need to evaluate that derivative at those x and y coordinates. Now the problem of course is if that I'm defining this curve with the equation r equals f of theta, and I think about uh, trying to take the derivative of r with respect to theta, uh, you should see that that quantity does not measure the slope of the tangent line to that point on the curve. I mean, think about what dy dx is, rate of change of y with respect to x, which directs or relates directly to slope dr d theta is what? It's the rate of change of the distance from the origin, the directed distance from the origin, as you rotate your position relative to the origin counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. So whatever this rate measures, well we just said what it measures, it definitely doesn't measure the rate of change of y with respect to x, which is the slope of the tangent line. Okay, so the upshot is uh, I'm going to have to do something else with this polar function to determine the slope of the tangent line instead of looking at dr d theta. But that's easy. Uh, we can go back to the basic defining equations that help us convert from polar to rectangular. Uh, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. And of course, uh, in those equations, as we've looked at them before, we've always been viewing the r as a constant because we were just moving around a circle of radius r. Okay, notice now that we're dealing with r as something that's changing. r is a function of theta, so as I rotate, my distance from the origin changes. That means this r is now variable. Specifically, we're saying x is equal to r times cosine theta, and y is equal to r times sine theta. So in other words, x and y depend on theta, 
but of course part of this expression now that determines x and y involves this f of theta function. All right, now, what does that look like? Well, it looks like x is some function of theta. That is, if I called this entire thing some g function, and this is some, let's say, h of theta. And of course, that looks a lot like parametric equations. We know from uh, section 9.5, when we have x is a function of t and y is a function of t, some other function of t, uh, we know from the main theorem in that section that we can find the derivative of y with respect to x by looking at the derivative of y with respect to t over the derivative of x with respect to t. In other words, f prime of t over g prime of t. Well, that's exactly what I've got here with these two equations. I've got a pair of parametric equations. Uh, it's just that my parameter is now theta instead of t. Okay, so what is dy dx uh, from these equations? Well, it would be dy d theta over dx d theta because I have two parametric equations that express x and y as functions of theta. So that would be the derivative with respect to theta of y, which we're saying is f of theta times sine theta over the derivative with respect to theta of x, which is f of theta times cosine theta. And from this, we get a very simple formula. The derivative of y with respect to x, given a polar function, should be what? Uh, starting with the top part, that looks like just a simple product rule. It would be f prime of theta sine theta plus f of theta cosine theta over the derivative of x with respect to theta, which would be f prime of theta cosine theta. Uh, that'd be minus f of theta sine theta. And that is the formula you'll see in the book for the derivative of y with respect to x given that r is equal to f of theta. And so that means on my polar curve, if this is the point in polar coordinates r theta, and I wanted to know what the slope of the tangent line was to that curve, I would simply evaluate that formula for the derivative I've highlighted in green there at this value of theta. Now note there's uh, something important to notice here. Suppose f of theta equals zero. In other words, suppose theta is an angle of rotation that gets you back to the pole, back to the origin. Uh, notice that if f of theta is zero, then of course that means this would be zero and this would be zero, which would mean dy dx is equal to f prime of theta sine theta over f prime of theta cosine theta. Assuming f prime of theta is not zero, uh, notice that that would be sine theta over cosine theta, which would be tangent theta. Okay, why is that important? Well, what it says is if you have a polar curve of some kind, and let's say you arrive back at the origin at this theta value, let's say that's something like theta equals pi over 4 maybe. Okay, we're saying that at that point, the slope of the polar curve would be what? Well, if you're at a point where f of theta equals zero, then the slope of the curve is just the tangent of the angle. That is the theta that got you to that position at the pole. So in my picture here, we're saying the slope of the tangent line to that curve at the origin at that time or at that theta value would be tangent of pi over four, which would be one. Okay, that means it's especially easy to compute the slope of the tangent line at the pole.
because it's simply the tangent of the theta angle. That can be a useful fact in, again, graphing more exotic graphs because if you know the slope of the tangent line, you can certainly use that as a guide to drawing your picture. As you draw the picture, the slope of the tangent line, the tilt of the tangent line, guides how you draw the graph. It dictates the shape of the graph, the direction of the graph. So a useful fact it can be for graphing. So we, before we go on to the last part of the section, uh, let's take a minute to just sort of out loud uh, think about a general strategy for graphing polar functions. And of course this isn't going to be the book version because the first thing I'm going to say is uh, use uh, basic, let's say canonical forms that we know as a guide. And since most of the polar functions we're using in this book, in this class, in a typical Calculus 2 class are known polar graphs like circles and limachons and lemniscates and roses, um, there's no point reinventing the wheel. I mean, it's, it's good practice to use things that are known to learn how to graph things by hand. Uh, but when I need to get the work done, uh, the first thing I would do is go to the table that's in the book and look at the forms I know and see if I can match it up with something I know. In conjunction with that, let's say together with that, uh, a graphing utility like the one I showed you in Desmos would be really useful to bring in. Um, now beyond that, of course, we're talking about graphing by hand. And so what are some of the things we've talked about? Well, we've certainly talked about checking for symmetry. And we already said why that would be useful if we knew it was symmetric with respect to the x-axis and I could determine what the top half of the graph looks like, then I automatically know what the bottom half looks like. And then the same for the other two symmetries. So if, I can, uh, if I'm willing to take the time to check symmetries, uh, since it turns out a lot of these polar graphs do have symmetries, uh, that can certainly be useful. Um, another thing to check is when does the graph... Um, intersect, or let's say, when is the graph hit the pole? In other words, when is the polar graph at a position where r is equal to zero? I know from looking at a lot of these polar graphs, there's a lot of circles and loops, uh, things that start at zero and then make loops and come back to zero. Um, it's, it's nice to know where those zeros are. It gives me a starting point and ending point, and if I can figure out what happens in between, I'm probably uh, more than halfway on my way to figuring out what the graph looks like. So determining where r equals zero, which would mean setting my polar function equal to zero and solving some equation, usually some sort of trigonometric equation. Um, along with that, let's just say related to that, is I automatically now know that the tangent of theta would be the slope of the tangent line at such points. And again, that can be useful in drawing your picture to get the shape right. Five, and you might actually make this number one, and no big surprise here, make a table of values. So the same old uh, brute force strategy that worked in college algebra, when you encountered a function that you didn't know from previous experience and you didn't have anything else to fall back on, the, the easiest approach, the simplest, is to make a table. And you know that if you can plot enough points and make a, a reasonable inference about how the points connect, then you can more or less connect the dots and again, if you use that in conjunction with symmetry, uh, making a good table can probably get you the graph you're after. 
Um, so just as an example of this, just to show you the process, and there's nothing very profound here, but just to walk through it once and see it, uh, let's look at something like r equals 1 minus 3 sine theta. And you should recognize when you look at that that it's one of those Limachons. I'll let you think about the ratio of the a to b there. The a is 1, the b is minus 3. So disregarding the negative, that's a ratio of one third. And you should remember that's a Limachon with a loop. All right, now let's uh, let's go to Desmos, and I've entered this one up here, so you can see on the top line there, I've got that r equals one minus three sine theta. And of course, you know I'm guessing, but I've gone ahead and run it from zero to two pi. Why would I do that? because the only trig function in that polar function is sine, and I know sine is periodic, period 2 pi. So I'm pretty sure based on that, that 0 to 2 pi will trace out the entire cycle of this curve once before it repeats itself. So here, let's watch it. Um, let me blow it up a little bit. So let's see. So it rotates. It rotates, okay, and there's the Limachon with the outer loop and the inner loop. Now, before I go back to uh, the table here, let's follow this for a second. So you can see there, I'm back at the pole, and it looks like I didn't make it all the way to pi over 2. In fact, I'll show you in the table for a, in a minute that it's a very small angle that I'm pointing out in the uh, first quadrant and I'm already at pi over, I'm already back at the pole. So what am I doing from that angle to pi over two? Your R is actually negative and you're tracing out that part of the curve. Your R is also negative on this part of the curve because you're actually at an angle in quadrant two. And by the way, when you trace this part of the graph, it's clear that there's y-axis symmetry. So if I had checked the symmetry to begin with, I would have concluded y-axis symmetry, which means once I knew once I knew that half, that little loop, I automatically knew the little loop on the other side. Once I knew that part below the x-axis on the left side of the y-axis, I automatically knew that part. Put those two together, and that gets me that part. Okay, then what happens from pi to 2 pi? Well, if I plot points and connect dots, again, with symmetry, you can see the left side looks just like the right side. There's my graph. So I could get a graph of this even without this graphing utility if I just checked symmetry and found that I had y-axis symmetry. And then if you'll notice here, All I really need to do is make a table. And you know there's nothing fancy about this. Um, down below there, you can see what I've done. So I've taken that function, 1 minus 3 sine theta. And in that first row, I'm computing values of r for theta equals 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. Um, and actually, if I go to plot this, I'm going to plot exactly what it says. So make sure this makes sense, what you see me doing here. So this first one says when r is, or I'm sorry, when theta is 0. Let me make that highlighter a little smaller. When theta is 0, r is 1. Which means when theta is 0, I'm sitting right there. Notice when theta equals pi over 6, my r is already negative. So when I'm pointing out in this pi over 6 direction, I start at the pole, the origin, and I go backwards down along this line. And how far do I go? I go a distance of 1 half, which means I would be, let's say, right about there. Now, what's the thing I skipped there? I went from positive R's to negative R's. There's a really good chance I went through the pole there. So if I took 1 minus 3 sine theta, 
and set that to zero, of course I would get sine theta equals one third. And if you do that, you get theta from your calculator is about 19 degrees. Okay, pi over 12 is 15 degrees. So if I rotate just a little bit further than 15 degrees, I'm already back at the pole. If I plotted a couple other points between 0 and 19 degrees, I would find that there's a little loop here. Now, once I determine that that loop is there, I know there's going to be one just like it on the other side. Now, what happens once I make it to 0? Well, if I watch these numbers, what are they doing? As the theta continues to increase, this r gets more and more negative, which means as I rotate through that first quadrant, I'm going to move backwards to points in the third quadrant further and further away. In particular, let's see, when I'm at pi over 6, we're at negative 1 half. We already plotted that one. When I'm at pi over 4, when I'm pointing in this direction, I'll go backwards along this line. And what's the distance? Negative 1.1. That would be right about there, let's say. Pi over 3, I'm at negative 1.6. So when I'm pointing this direction, I'll go backwards, which means I move along this line. And I'll move out to a distance of 1.6, which would be right about here. Pi over 2, by the time I rotate to that, I'm at negative 2, which means I'm here. Okay, if I plot enough points, it's not going to take too long to convince myself that there is a loop there. And by symmetry, I know the same thing's going to happen on the other side. That is, there's going to be a point like that. There's going to be a point like that. And there's going to be a point like that. So something like this. Badly drawn, but you get the idea. Okay, now, what does that get me? That gets me to pi. And just, again, think about the rotation that happened here. And just so you can visualize it, I just did this part of the graph. Oops, wrong one. I don't know why I zoomed in that much, or zoomed out that much. We just did this part, so here, let's talk through it. I'm actually at pi over 2 there. I'm just moving backwards down to negative 2. Now I'm at pi. Now, what's going to happen once I pass pi? Well, let's go back to our graph. And you can see I've plotted those in the next row. So what happens when I'm at 7 pi over 6, which is pointing that direction? I move out from the origin over a positive distance of 2.5. So 1 to 2.5. Uh, what happens when I get to 5 pi over 4? I go to 3.1, which would be right about there. 4 pi over 3, I'm increasing a little bit more, and now it's 3.6. By the time I get to 3 pi over 2, I'm at 4. So what happens once I leave this point right here, which is the one I got when I landed at theta equals pi, well, I keep rotating and I make this next loop. By symmetry, I know there's going to be a similar one on the other side. Uh, not similar, exactly the same. So one there, one there and one right about there. And I'll connect the dots. And of course, when I get back to 2 pi, I find that 1 minus 3 times the sine of 2 pi is equal to 1, which means I'm back at the point I started at. And I know now, because of the periodicity of the sine function, I'm just going to repeat this. This, you know, shouldn't look too strange to you. This is the sort of process you go through when you're graphing any function. It's just that there's a little bit more complication here because of the rotation. It's, it's not a rectangular table. 
It's a table of theta rotation angles and R values, which are directed distances from the origin. But you can still attack it with a table and plot points and connect dots. So in a pinch, you can do some analysis like this, but really your, your go-to should be a graphing utility and then relying on the, the table of known polar functions, which is mainly where we're going to be working with circles, limachons, etc. All right, so that said, it seems like I'm de-emphasizing uh, the drilling on graphing by hand, and I suppose I am. That brings us to the last part in this section, though, which is something you definitely need to practice, and that's finding intersections of polar curves. So you may already be anticipating the, the problem that we're going to run into with trying to find intersections of polar curves. If you think back to those parameterizations of circles that we talked about back in section 9.4. So if you think about, for example, x equals cosine t, y equals sine t. Uh, and obviously now we know that those t's could very well be thetas. It's just the letter I chose. And if I parameterize this from 0 to 2 pi, I know that's the standard uh, trip around the circle one time going counterclockwise. If I think about something like x equals cosine 2t, y equals sine 2t, also from 0 to 2 pi, if you think back to that, we realize that the graph of that was also a circle, except in that interval from 0 to 2 pi, we actually traveled around that circle twice. Okay, so that means, for example, um, when I'm sitting at this point, as I'm traveling using this set of parametric equations, at the same value of t down here, where is this set of parametric equations getting me? <clears throat> well, if this set of parametric equations makes me travel around the curve twice as fast, then I would be here. Okay, meaning even though I'm getting the same curve, I'm actually never going to be at the same location at the same time or at the same theta value. Meaning it's going to be hard to try and set these equations equal to each other to try and find a point of intersection if it's not the same theta that gets me the same physical location at the same theta value. Uh, for an even simpler example of this, Think about these really simple polar equations, r equals 1 and r equals negative 1. We know that r equals 1 is simply a unit circle where the orientation is counterclockwise. And where do we start? We start at the position 1, 0. OK, what's this other circle? Well, it's also a circle, but when theta equals 0, what position do I actually occupy? Well, when theta is 0, you're pointed this way, you're aiming that way, but the r equals negative 1 means you go backwards. So you leave the origin, and you go one unit to the left, which means you actually end up here. Now, what happens as theta increases? Well, as theta increases, my radial values are negative, which means I actually go backwards, which means I am tracing out the curve this way. That is, it's still the unit circle, but it's clockwise. And the starting point is over here at negative 1, 0. So let's say here in purple, I started at 1, 0, and for this one I started at negative 1, 0. Okay, so the simple fact is, for no theta value, are these two going to be the same at the same time? Uh, in fact, I can see that very clearly if I try and set these equal to each other. 
Now if I ask you when is r equals 1 equal to r equals negative 1, of course the answer is never. There's no solution to that. But obviously it's the same graph. So if I ask you where do these two graphs intersect, the answer is everywhere. Everywhere on their domains. Alright, so we're going to have to come up with some other way to figure out uh, how to find those points of intersection when I don't have the graphs in front of me. How can I do it from the equations? Okay, there's a real simple answer to that, and we've already talked about it. What is the thing that's making me run into this situation of having the graphs be out of phase like this? Well, it's because of this business of pointing one direction and moving back backwards, right? In this case, R is positive, so I'm always moving in the direction I'm pointing. In this case, R is negative, which means I'm always moving backwards from the directions I'm pointing. All right, so that means I need a way to compensate for that change in direction. And that's simple. If I have a polar function like, in fact, let's go to another page for this. So let's say we have two polar functions, R equals F of theta, R equals G of theta. We're trying to find the intersection. And let's suppose it turns out that the point r theta ends up being a point of intersection. And we're trying to figure out how to find that point. And of course, the first thing I would try, and this will actually yield many points of intersection, if not all, is to set the two equal. And I may very well find this point from setting those two equal. Okay, and, and how would that happen? It would be that both f and g, both functions, are pointing to this point with the same positive r and the same positive theta of inclination above the x-axis. Okay, but what is the other way that these two functions could coincide at that point? Well, it could be that, let's say, f is pointing to this point for this r and this theta. Meanwhile, let's say that this g is actually at this angle, but the r is negative, right? So whatever g is doing, uh, it actually hits this red point that I have up here, this one. It actually hits this point when the theta is this green angle down in quadrant 3, and the r is the opposite of this r. And you know from what we've looked at so far that that's perfectly doable, perfectly possible. Okay, so the question is how to capture that. Well, what I'd really like to do is change the f equation so that it actually hits that red point at the same theta and with the same r as this equation. Okay, how would I do that? Well, if I could modify this r equals f of theta equation so that it's basically doing what the g is doing. That is, instead of rotating through theta, it rotates to this angle, which would be pi plus theta, and then changes the r to a negative r so that it actually goes backwards, and then I'm at that same spot for both functions at the same time. Okay, so the question is, if r equals f of theta is pointing to this point using this positive theta and this positive r, how do I make it point to that point with this angle and this r? Well, I'd have to negate the r so that the r is going backwards, and I'd have to change that theta to f of theta plus pi. In other words, what I've done there is I've taken the equation r equals f of theta, and when I multiply the r by a negative, I'm reversing the direction. What happens when you reverse the direction of that radius? You're doing one half turn, which means you should add a pi to the argument in your function. All right, question What would happen if I multiplied by a negative one again? Well, then I should add another pi. Because if I renegate this, if I negate it a second time, 
that means I'm flipping the direction on my R, which means I'd have to rotate another half turn. Okay, notice what that gives you for this equation. It gives you positive R equals F of theta plus 2 pi. If F happens to be a function that is periodic 2 pi, then you know F of theta plus 2 pi is just F of theta. And then we're back to our original equation. Meaning for most polar functions that have a period of 2 pi, uh, when I do this trick of multiplying by negative 1 once, that's going to give me this other equation that gets me this point only by going in reverse with the r. And then if I multiply by negative 1 again, any polar function that's periodic period 2 pi comes right back to the original function, which means there are only really two functions that I need to consider. There is the original r equals f of theta, and there is the function negative r equals f of theta plus pi. Now, are all trig functions periodic to pi? And of course the answer is no. Some are periodic more or less frequently than that. All right, but what we've stumbled on here is definitely a method that will work and here's basically the procedure. I'm going to take this r equals f of theta equation and I'm going to multiply by negative 1. And every time I multiply by negative 1, I'm going to rotate that theta through one half turn. I'm going to keep doing that as many times as I have to. So let's say I do negative 1 squared equals f of theta plus 2 pi, negative 1 cubed equals f of theta plus 3 pi. And I keep doing this until eventually, and this will happen eventually, eventually you'll hit an n, that is where you have multiplied the r by a negative repeatedly n times, so that you're sitting over here at f of theta plus n pi, and if the period is either an integer or any fraction, eventually there is some least common multiple integer that will hit any of these polar functions we're working on, unless the period is irrational, which we're not going to deal with anything like that. If it takes n of these equations, then, then actually, let's say by the time you do this n times, you're back to the one you started with. That means what you have there are n different equations. Okay, in the example we did before where we had r equals f of theta, and we multiplied by a negative once and turned into an f of theta plus pi, and then we did it again and ended up with f of theta plus 2 pi, and we recognized that the function we were working on was periodic 2 pi, then really what I have are two equations because this one is right back to where I started. That means the two equations that I have to consider are these two. I'm going to do the same thing with the G. There may be two or three or any number of equations for G that get me to the same location but moving R either forwards or backwards. Okay, let's say I end up with N equations for the R equals F of theta equation. And let's say I end up with m equations for the r equals g of theta equation. Then there are m times n different equations I can build by equating each of these equations to each of these. Now, what's the worst case scenario going to be for us in almost anything we would do? Uh, probably two equations for this one and two equations for this one, which means at worst you're talking about four equations. That's where you equate each of these functions to each of these functions. Okay, for example, and this will uh, give you a concrete example of how this process works. Let's consider r equals 2 sine 2 theta. And the other equation will be r equals 1. All right, now, I, you know, I have the advantage of knowing what this is. I recognize that that's one of those roses 
and since n is even, that means this is one of those roses with four petals. So let me start with the easier equation. Let's take this uh, simple r equals 1 over here on the right. Okay, what happens when I take my little approach of multiplying both sides by, or multiplying r by negative 1? Well, that would be negative r. And then what happens when I replace theta by theta plus pi? Well, nothing happens to the 1 because that's just a constant, which means what I really get is r equals negative 1. What happens if I take r equals negative 1 and I replace r by a negative r again, or in other words, I multiply r by negative 1? I get negative r equals negative 1. But that's really just r equals 1, which is the equation I started out with. Okay, so what I'm saying there is the only two variations of this equation that can get me to the same location but with different thetas, that is thetas that are out of phase by pi or one half turn, is r equals 1 and r equals negative 1. In fact, that's the simplest possible example we could have started with to see this process. And again, I'm going to, uh, even though you have the video here, I'm going to do it one more time just for emphasis here. So what I did again is I took r equals 1 and I multiplied r by negative 1. When I did that, we know from what we said before that we should change f of theta to f of theta plus pi. Well, in this case, you just happen to be working with a constant function of theta, which means when you replace theta by theta plus pi, nothing happens. You still have 1. Okay, but what is that actually? It's really just r equals negative 1. And that is definitely a different equation than the one I started with. It yields a different graph. And again, it's that one we talked about before. I'm getting the same points, but I have to get to them by moving backwards at angles that are out of phase by pi radians. Okay, what happens if I do the process again? Again, I multiply r by negative 1, and I replace theta by theta plus pi in my function, but my function is just the constant negative 1, which means I really have r equals 1, which is the equation I started with. Therefore, there are only two unique or distinct equations that can get me to the same location, but do it by moving forwards or backwards. r equals 1, r equals negative 1. Okay, let's do the same thing for the other one. In fact, let me just uh, erase this now so we've got room to work. And we'll just say over here on the side that r equals 1 and r equals negative 1 are our two equations for this one. Now let's go through the process for r equals 2 sine 2 theta. So starting with r equals 2 sine 2 theta, what's the first thing I do? I replace r by negative r, that is I multiply r by negative 1. When I do that, to compensate, I have to replace theta by theta plus pi. Of course, that's just negative r equals 2 times sine of 2 theta plus 2 pi. Okay, but what do I know about the sine function? I know it is periodic, period 2 pi, which means this is really just the same thing as sine of 2 pi, meaning I have negative r equals 2 sine of 2 theta. Okay, and of course, that is not clearly not the same equation as the one I started with. It's the opposite of it. Okay, that means I need to keep going until I eventually get back to this same equation. So now I repeat the process. Now I'm going to multiply by negative 1, which would turn that negative r into an r. Then what do I do on the right? I change that theta to a theta plus pi again. Well, of course, the same thing's going to happen that just happened a couple lines ago. I'm looking at r equals 2 times the sine of 2 theta plus 2 pi. But again, 
sine is periodic to pi, which means that expression on the right is just 2 sine of 2 theta. And that means I am back to where I started. This equation is the same as the one I started with. So what's the only other distinct equa equation I got that's different than the one I started with? It's this one right here. So actually, what are the two equations? They are r equals 2 sine 2 theta and r equals negative 2 sine 2 theta. No big surprise there. The second one is just the one that goes backwards from the first one. All right, put that together with this, and I have four equations now. What are they? I have 2 sine 2 theta equals 1. I have 2 sine 2 theta equals negative 1. I have negative 2 sine 2 theta equals 1. I have negative 2 sine 2 theta equals negative 1. Now, we actually get a bonus here, and this happens quite often. You'll notice uh, even though there are four equations there, there really aren't. There's some redundancy there. This, equa oops. this equation is the same as this one. One and four are the same thing. And similarly, this equation and this equation are the same. So there's really just two equations. There's this one and there's this one. So we're talking about these two. So we have 2 sine 2 theta equals 1, 2 sine 2 theta equals negative 1, or our two equations are sine 2 theta equals 1 half, sine 2 theta equals negative 1 half. All right, let's start checking. Let's see, for this first one, sine of 2 theta equals 1 half, I know the first positive angle greater than 0 whose sine could be 1 half is pi over 6. So that means I would be looking for when is 2 theta equal to pi over 6, which of course means theta equals pi over 12. What's the next angle at which 2 theta or the sine of something can be 1 half? It would be at 5 pi over 6. So I'm thinking. Here's the first place where the sine can be 1 half. Here's the next place where the sine can be 1 half. So that means 2 theta would be 5 pi over 6. Or in other words, theta equals 5 pi over 12. OK, where's the next place? Well, it's not here because the sine is negative there. It's not there because the sine is negative there. So if I keep rotating, the next place where the sine would be 1 half would be here after I've made one full rotation and gone another pi over 6. And that would be 13 pi over 6. So that means 2 theta could be 13 pi over 6, uh, which means what? Theta equals 13 pi over 12. Notice. That's still a valid theta between 0 and 2 pi. Actually, I'm just a little bit bigger than pi there. So that means I'd have to go to the next one. Where's the next angle if I keep rotating where 2 theta, the sine of that, could be 1 half? It would be at this guy. And that would be, what, 17 pi over 6? So I'd be looking at when is... 2 theta equal to 17 pi over 6. That would be when theta is 17 pi over 12. Notice we're getting closer now to 2 pi. OK, if I keep going, where's the next place that I would rotate to where the sine would be 1 half? Well, it wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be here. It would be back to this, which would be two full rotations plus another pi over 6. Well, let's see, two rotations around. And we're multiplying, or we're swinging around by multiples of pi over 6. So once around is 12 pi over 6, twice around is 25 pi over 6. And then one more turn of pi over 6 would put me at 25 pi 
over 6. So if 2 theta was equal to 25 pi over 6, that means theta would be 25 pi over 12. And that's too far. That's further than 2 pi. And I know I've gone too far because this thing is definitely, well, let me back up a second. The circle, the r equals 1, I know the period of that is 2 pi. Uh, we haven't set it yet, but what's the period of this r equals 2 sine 2 theta? And you should recognize the period of that is pi. Okay, but I'm going all the way around because that r equals 1 circle, I know that requires 0 to 2 pi. All right, now, uh, let's think about it here. Using what I know, and there's, uh, this is the point where I want to bring in what I know, I do know that something like sine of 2 theta is a polar rose with four petals. Where does it start? Well, where is this thing positioned when theta is equal to 0? Well, that would be r equals sine of 0, which is 0. Okay, then what happens by the time, let's say, I rotate to pi over 2? So let's say I've started here and I've done my rotation all the way up to here. Well, by the time I get to pi over 2, and that theta is pi over 2, I'm actually sitting at r equals sine of pi, which is 0. Okay, that, okay, that means what happened in between 0 and pi over 2? I started at the pole... when I was at 0, and by the time I rotated to pi over 2, I was back at the pole again. Okay, since I know this is a rose, I think it's fair to conclude what must have happened. I must have done one petal of that rose in between 0 and 2 pi. And of course, I can verify that by looking in my table, or using my utility, or even just plotting a few, few points if I want to do it by hand. Uh, if it were me, I would go to the graphing utility and just verify that the sine of 2 theta is a rose with four petals. There's symmetry with respect to the x. That doesn't look symmetric. Symmetry with respect to the x-axis, the y-axis, and the origin. It's, it's got all three. Okay. And for a better picture of this, let's actually go to Desmos. And there it is. All right, so you can see there's my polar rose. And actually, you can see that there are eight intersection points. Now, we're, we're cheating a little bit here because we've got this nice polar grid that tells us, uh, looks like at least if we can trust this, that that first intersection happens at pi over 12. And notice that was one of our values we found. Now, where are the rest? Well, that next one in that first quadrant, that looks like 5 pi over 12. So let's go back to our list, and here's what we've got so far. It looks like we've got one, two, three, four points of intersection. Pi over 12, 5 pi over 12, 13 pi over 12, 17 pi over 12. Okay, do you notice where all of these angles are back in our Desmos picture? The first two, the pi over 12 and the 5 pi over 12, are those first two that you see in quadrant 2. So rotating around counterclockwise from the polar axis. The first two, the two intersections in quadrant 1, are rotating clockwise, or counterclockwise, pi over 12 and 5 pi over 12. Where are the next two, the 13 pi over 12 and the 17 pi over 12? Well, the 13 pi over 12 is the first one in quadrant 3, rotating counterclockwise. And then the last one, 17 pi over 12, is that second one in quadrant 3. Now, that makes perfect sense if you think about how this is traced out. So just uh, think about it for a minute. If we watch the rows, there's the first intersection point. And notice that's a point where r is positive for both graphs and they intersect at the same theta. So that's one that we're detecting by setting the original two polar functions equal to each other. They are coinciding at the same r and the same theta. Okay, at the next one, which is 5 pi over 12, same story, they're intersecting at the same theta and the same r. 
Now I keep going. Notice at that next one, they're not intersecting at the same R and the same theta. Okay, for that one, for the red circle, notice the angle is an angle in quadrant four and the R is positive. But for the polar rows, my angle is in quadrant two and my R is negative. And that makes sense. What's the other way you can hit a point in quadrant four other than doing an angle in quadrant four and a positive R? It's to go to the quadrant across the origin from it, which is quadrant two, have an angle in quadrant two that you go to, and then move backwards into quadrant four. All right, in other words, that third intersection point you see there is going to come from the other equation that we set up, the one where I'm setting one of the functions equal to the negative of the other. So if I keep going, there's another one like that. Now, what happens once I get into quadrant three? Well, there's that fifth intersection, and notice in that one, R is positive on both graphs, and the angle is in quadrant three for both graphs, for the rows and the circle. Same thing for that one. Okay, that's why I'm getting those two intersection points in quadrant one and quadrant four from this first equation. Now, it shouldn't be too hard to imagine that I'm going to get the other four intersection points, that is the two in quadrant four and the other two in quadrant two, by setting one of the functions equal to the negative of the other function, which is our other equation, that is this one right here. All right, this is kind of a painstaking process, but again, in summary, what are you doing? You're creating every variation you can of each of the two equations by multiplying r repeatedly by negative one, and each time you do, you replace theta, or the, the previous argument in your function, by that argument plus pi. In other words, you keep rotating by pi every time you negate the r. If you keep doing that, eventually you're going to run out of distinct equations and you're going to be back at the equation you started at. However many equations you can produce doing that process for each of the two equations, you're going to set all of those different equations equal to each other and create every combination you can. And again, you're really not going to have to do more than two equations for each one. And actually, you can see in this one that most of the time you're really just boiling it down to two equations, which makes sense. The two that you're usually going to be doing are f of theta equals g of theta, but the other one's going to be something like f of theta equals negative g of theta. And for 99 out of 100 problems, that's probably going to be the set of two equations that you have to work with. And don't be surprised if, for example, one of the equations gets you half of the intersections and the other equation gets you the other half, if there happen to be an even number. Okay, that's the process, but remember, you also want to rely on your grapher. Uh, you can see how easy this problem becomes when I use the graphing utility. Um, actually, if I use this graphing utility, I can actually see that that first angle is pi over 12. It's halfway between 0 and pi over 6. Uh, once I observe that, and let's say I verify it just by setting the functions equal to each other and making sure I get that same location with r equals 1 and theta equals pi over 12, then once I know I have, once I know I have symmetry, then I can generate all of the other intersection points very quickly. All right, so... Um, of all the things in this section, the one you want to focus on the most when you get to it is the set of problems near the end where I've got you finding intersections. Make sure you practice that before you go on to the last section where we're going to find areas. And I'll stop there.